Hello, gorgeous people, and welcome to another TV Central 101 podcast. I'm Aaron Ryan. This is episode 45, 2023. Mark Fennell is an Australian journalist, presenter, and author who is best stolen for his work at SBS here in Australia. He has hosted several television and radio programs and is recognised for his expertise in technology, media and popular culture. Mark Fennell began his career as a radio presenter and producer, hosting shows on Triple J. He gained recognition for his ability to, to dissect complex technological concepts and present them in an accessible and entertaining manner. Fennell's passion for technology and media led him to become a trusted commentator in the field. He currently is the host of quiz show Mastermind, but is now presenting a brand new documentary called The Kingdom. In a deeply personal documentary, Mark investigates how Australia produced one of the world's most successful and scandal-plagued megachurches, Hillsong, and asks, if this kingdom is crumbling, then who will take its place? Mark Fennell joins me now. Welcome to TV Central, Mark. Hello, how are you? I, I, I love your intro. I, I, I felt like I was sitting in like, this is your life. <laughs> Better you have like a big book. <laughs> yes, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> then you like pull out all these childhood photos. Where yeah. were you when this happened? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's start with your own years gone by experiences with Hillsong and, and Pentecostal churches. What are your own memories? Uh, well, I was sort of born into the world of Pentecostal Christianity, to be honest with you. I, I left that, that world when I was sort of around 19, 20, that age, that kind of age, but I was born into, and we ended up going to a whole host of different sized Pentecostal churches from, you know, the sort of small ones that, that are in, um, RSLs through to ones that meet in school halls, but it, it did actually start with the, I guess the big one, the one that would eventually become Hillsong. And I, it's funny, I found a photo, I was going through family photos at my mum's place and I actually found this photo yeah. um, that, that it starts the film. Um, it's a picture of me aged five and my brother's getting, I think what the, whatever the equivalent of a christening was. And over my shoulder was um, the notorious uh, Frank Houston, who uh, actually in years later we would discover was a confessed pedophile. And I remember looking at this picture going, oh, okay, didn't realize that existed. And it was kind of like the tip of the iceberg of things I didn't quite remember from that part of my my childhood. And so I guess the origin of the, the film is that most people I know, most people I work with had no idea about my background as well, because I sort of left and didn't really ever talk about it. I think I've mentioned it sporadically over the years. And um, what was interesting for me was having not been in that world for a long time, kind of watching from afar the this meteoric rise of particularly Hillsong. I mean, the whole, I mean, it was Pentecostalism was the fastest growing uh, denomination in Australia for, for quite a while. It has interestingly plateaued, but watching Hillsong in particular was fascinating because there was this thing that I remember from my childhood that suddenly became massive. They set up churches around the U S they were winning Grammys and, you know, millions of people listen to and sing Hillsong songs every week in churches that aren't just Hillsong. I mean, in, in my primary school, which was Anglican, we sang Hillsong songs, right? So it's yeah. sort of co- growth was quite an interesting thing to watch from afar. And then in the last sort of two, three years, watching, I guess, the implosion has also has also been kind of curious. So we know that in, a, in the wake of a whole host of scandals, uh, and scandals is, you know, my diplomatic way of putting it, there's been accusations of you know, sexual impropriety, financial mismanagement. It's, it's big and important stuff. Mm. We know that they're losing, uh, attendees. We know that they're losing revenue and what is happening concurrent with that is a whole bunch of other churches, Australian Pentecostal churches, many of whom who've kind of lived in the shadow of Hillsong are moving in essentially. And they are inheriting that, that privately they will admit that they are inheriting um, many disaffected, or I guess Hillsong attendees who, who feel like their trust has been broken, put it that way. Mm, and yeah. so we're at this kind of crucial turning point in the history of, of this, this sort of faith. And I guess the question for me was initially was, well, hold on, how is it that Australia of all different places could actually birth this huge kind of, I mean, really, when you think about, <laughs> when you think about Hillsong, uh, the cultural exports, it should honestly go like iron ore, Hemsworth Brothers Hillsong because the cultural impact <laughs> is so massive. So how did that, how is it that that happened? But then as we stand at this turning point, will the, will history repeat? Has have lessons been learned? 
Um, now that was the starting point, but then at what this interesting thing happened where I started doing these interviews and I'd get to the end of the interviews and I'd ha enter like a weird fugue state, Aaron, where I'd be sitting there just being like, I feel like I've regressed to childhood. And then the team, and this is a small team that we have. It's really only like, you know, six people all up in the whole team. And they just sort of looked at me and, went, and they've known me for years. They're like, are you okay? And I, and I was like, actually, I'm not sure. So at, at a certain point we decided to turn the camera around on me and they were just like, we're just going to ask you all these questions about your childhood. And suddenly I was like, oh, suddenly I was like telling all these stories about churches I'd grown up in. And, you know, I reckon I was the only kid in primary school that had uh, demons regularly thrown out of people in their living room on a Wednesday night. Like um, all this stuff just started coming out. I was like, oh, that is unusual. And I think, so it, it, on the one hand, it's a very wide angle view of a turning point. Uh, and also trying to explain to people out who've never been inside that world, what the sort of, what, I guess what the attraction is, because I think, uh, often when these, you know, like, you know, when these sort of stories are done, um, that, you know, on, on, on news, there's always these like salacious stories about Pentecostal churches are always about the money or about yeah. sex scandals. And that some of that stuff's really important, I think, worthy of coverage. But I think underneath there's like this little seething, like, look at these people, these freaks and what they believe. And I just didn't want to do that because I have family yeah. members who are still in it. So on the one hand, I'm trying to, you know, make sense and make sure people outside the world understand, I guess, what the attraction is, why people are drawn into this world. But at the same time, I do think there's a, I guess, a sort of toxic positivity that sits at the core of some of these uh, environments where talking about like talking about the issues with the model uh often can happen in small contexts but it isn't like a very big public conversation in some churches i know some churches are really good at this so i, I don't want to kind of paint the whole faith with with um with uh with one color right because we're talking about lots of different communities here but it was sort of an opportunity to go can we do something that still treats people with respect um but then still kind of articulates you know this model that has been pioneered in australia and sent around the world are there ways in which it's leaving people behind? Are there ways in which it's hurt people? And the answer is yes. So can we do both was sort of yeah. the question. You're um, currently an unbeliever. Um, are you genuinely an unbeliever full stop? Or was it more that you never found God in, in the Pentecostal church? Mm, that's a good question, um, Aaron. I think, I guess I live my life as though I, there is no God is the short version of that. But yeah. I think when you're raised in something like this from birth, you never quite, you never quite lose the idea that there is a God, if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, I'm not in a rush to go back, you know, like I'm not, I'm unlikely to be converted anytime soon, but, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I guess he's, uh, it's, it's a fair enough question, Aaron. I think, I think what I come down to is, um, I think what I come down to is I don't, yeah, I live my life as though there there is no God, but at the same time, I will kind of weirdly defend people that do have faith, if you know what I mean. So yeah. if, if people out there have a set of beliefs, and this is not specifically limited to Christianity, I should say, if people out there have a sense of belief, uh, a sense of, a sense of values and beliefs that help them navigate what can be a very complicated, challenging world. And if they can execute and live their life according to the, that set of beliefs without hurting other people, then I'll always defend them. But it's the without hurting other people part that I yeah. think is always crucial because I think, and by no means is this limited to Pentecostalism or Christianity, uh, but I do think people of faith too often end up hurting other people. Uh, mm. And I think, and, and it's actually in the same way that people of like extreme political beliefs often hurt other people. I think, I think when you decide how you you want to live your life according to whatever moral code you adopt, I think it's incumbent upon you to make sure that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't detrimentally impact those around you. Just because you believe something doesn't mean that you necessarily have the right to dictate yeah. other people's feelings. You've actually touched on this, but um, I just want to talk about your motivation for making this documentary. Now, I've mm. watched it. It's well-researched. Um, it has balanced arguments and viewpoints. However, I'm, I'm not sure if you actually had a viewpoint about the Pentecostal church, aside from sharing your own experiences, because that's two distinctly different things. Was it more for the viewer to contemplate um, on the documentary themselves and figure it out for themselves? Because I don't think you actually shared any final conclusions, did you? No, and I won't. 
<laughs> in the same yeah. way that uh, when I make stuff British style, I can articulate this, the complicated and gray areas of a, of a story, but I won't ever tell you. And by the way, it's bad. It's not what I do. Like my job is, uh, my job is asking questions and my job is presenting it in a way that makes sense. And hopefully people can navigate and understand different perspectives. This was an unusual one because it has my story at the heart of it, but I'm, oh, look, the other thing is, I, it's not a thing you can, I don't think it's a thing you can pass judgment on, to be honest with you, because it's too complicated, right? We're talking about something that, like, if you were talking about the Pentecostal movement, right? That is millions of people around the world in sometimes they're, yes, they're in big churches. Sometimes they're in small churches and you can't paint. I don't feel confident coming out the other end and painting a picture of, well, this was all bad. Like every church has a coercive relationship with money. Every church overworks its volunteers. Like I, I can't say that for fact. And I wouldn't, what I can mm. do is I can put together, what we can do is we can, when you make something like this, what you're looking for is stories that help illuminate the whole. Right. And so I don't actually have a fully formed opinion about the Pentecostal movement, even about Hillsong itself, because within that community are people whose lives have undeniably been changed for the better. And then there's a whole bunch of people who feel like they've been spat up, chewed up and yeah. spat out. So I don't, yeah, I, you will, ne you will never get me to kind of uh, give you a definitive opinion on whether I think this thing is wholly good or wholly bad, because I think it's more complicated than that. And it's also not my job. Like I, I kind of stopped having opinions in public a couple of years ago, um, partially because I like being able to, I like being able to step into any room and talk to anyone and for them not to have a, for them not to assume what I think about anything. Um, mm -hmm. and cause that creates an environment where hopefully people feel more comfortable sharing themselves. And I'm much more interested in hearing from other people. I mean, <laughs> the irony of giving an interview where you wrap it on and then talk about shit. It's like, ultimately I'm more interested in hearing other people's experiences than talking about my own this has a lot of me in it this film more than i would ordinarily do and it was a function and it was a specific and set of circumstances that led to that being the case in this film i wouldn't do it all the time <laughs> <You know? laughs> like i obviously look quite uncomfortable in scenes uh but no i mean the short version of it is uh i don't have an opinion and i don't think i don't think me even confecting one would add to anyone's understanding really yeah uh, one one former Hillsong person you interviewed spoke about leaving there and going to a small church where the pastor knows everyone that can call call in on you and check on you, um, and it's a community, um, and that you know a church can't really uh, operate uh, on a size more than say seventy people. I mean, I'm in the exact situation, um, same situation. Uh, I was at the largest church in in WA. I left a few years ago to attend a church of about 70 people. Um, it's probably for the same reasons as her. But is that the conclusion that can be made, though, that mega churches cannot do what they're supposed to do, which is connect people with God on, on a personal level? Or or is it just the fact that all churches, big, small, um, if done right, can, can do what they're supposed to do? I think that's the conclusion that Sue arrived at for her and her faith. But at the same time, there are thousands of people that still go to these huge churches and uh, have amazing big experiences from the the size and scale of it, but find much more deeper community in the sort of smaller connect, connect, connect groups and things like that, that they have throughout the week. So I don't, I don't necessarily take it as a given that just because a church is big, it, it therefore becomes impersonal. Yeah. I think it's about how those communities are executed. Yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I mean that, I think Sue's conveying her experience and I think her experience was, is her experience. Others would argue that, you know, just because they've got big services on Sunday doesn't mean that you can't have more tight knit, more integrated communities, uh, smaller ones within the week. And, you know, it has to be pointed out. Most of the big churches are quite, um, I was <laughs> quite intense on, on getting people into small groups quite quickly because yeah. they must know that you, you, it's very easy to come in and bounce out if it's yeah. just the show. Right. So I don't necessarily, I, I, as with all of these things, it's about how it's executed. Absolutely. Um, and I think yeah. that's really the, 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 the distinction there. Um, yeah, I've been sort of at pains to point out that the film is not an attack on faith, right? It's a, it's an articulation of a, this model that in large degree was pioneered here in Australia and when, and mimicked around the country and now exported around the world, this model 
it clearly works for some people, but it also has come at a cost for others. And as we stand at this sort of turning point, the question is, can it be, can the problems that have plagued it in the past, can they be fixed? It's not about should it, you know, burn it to the ground or anything like that. Yeah. Although certainly there are people out there that have been hurt to the point that they feel that way. Yeah. And some people from who are watching it from outside that simply don't understand it, that think uh, it should, oh, well, maybe they do understand it and still think it should be burnt down. So there is, there is that view, but this, the, if, if you wanted to look at like what's at the kernel, if you wanted to look at what's at the kernel of the film, it's really there. This is a model that is, should be put under the microscope to ask the question, like, is it still working? And who is it working for and who is it not working for? And can it change? Mm. Uh, let's discuss an issue raised in the documentary, um, and that is tithing. Um, I will ask holistically first, what, what is your view on uh, money and the church? Big question. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, <laughs> I'm going to get you to, to shrink that one down to something achievable in a minute. Uh, I think, I mean, like any group, churches need money. Um, and tithing is not a, as, as is pointed out in the film, tithing is not a Pentecostal concept. Uh, it's mm. been around, uh, it exists, it's existed for thousands of years. Uh, I think, I think that, look, put it this way. Uh, the Bible is a thousand year old plus book, right? That was written over a period of time. Uh, it has many pages and many words. You can pick and choose what you choose to emphasize as a community, Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the kind of the resilient, I guess, Nate parts of, of, of Christianity is that pe people, it does, pe as people grow and change, they find different ways of interpreting it and placing it in their lives. I do think it is telling how some churches have made the giving and offering process incredibly central to their weekly activities. Yeah. Uh, and whereas other churches sort of, not like they churches need money like that, that they other churches talk about it in a way that's a little bit more um casual some of the language around tithing and actually less so tithing but some of the language around offering and giving that has been used in pentecostal churches around australia and the world is coercive and and manipulative um i don't think all churches use manipulative coercive language um but i think it, this is a moment as, as, as with any moment, this is a moment in particular where I think it's worth examining how faith communities talk about money uh, in a way that does it make people feel guilty if they're not giving? Uh, should they feel that way? Should they not feel that way? Is that the way, is that the way it should be framed in a faith environment? That is a question that I can't answer. It's actually a question that you and people who are in these churches need to answer about your own communities. Uh, mm. I start a conversation that I can never finish when you make films like this. <laughs> and that's the point. Like yeah, I, it, it matters more to me, but to, like it matters more to me that Christians watch it than non-Christians. I, I want non-Christians to watch it. So they understand, they have a you know an appreciation for that. It's not just, you know, people who have been brainwashed. I don't think that's true. Right. But I do think some of the articulation of the issues they're not necessarily raised by me, but they're raised by people who've had experience within the church. I think they're important because it's not ungodly to ask questions. It's not ungodly to ask questions about whether church leadership's transparent with how it spends its money. It's not ungodly to ask questions about whether volunteerism kind of tips into exploitation. It's not ungodly at all to ask these questions. Yeah. But it has to be, but it can't be answered. It can't be answered in big motherhood statements. It has to be answered in each individual faith community. Uh, and everybody who is in one of these churches, I would encourage to look around and ask the question, are we doing this well, or are we doing it in a way that's manipulative? And if your answer is actually, you know what, all those problems articulated in the film, they don't exist in my community, then that's great. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think that's a, a Rorschach test, I guess, for, for what people bring into the film more than necessarily what the film has to say. I don't think I need to break that down anymore. You uh, articulated that very well. Um, let, let's talk about the music. Um, obviously popular throughout the world. It's astonishing, really. I, I would say at least 30% of my Christian music uh, on Spotify is Hillsong. Um, you talk about the astonishing popularity of the music. And to be honest, it's not necessarily framed as a negative in the documentary, but there is always this underlying sinister thing in society that if it's popular then something is a bit off, almost like the norm should be that Christians should be listening to boring hymns, you know, played on a harp that nobody likes. Again, where, where is that balance found? 
I think people out yeah, outside of the Christian church do feel that way. Mm. Um, I think I think there is a view. I think there is a view for people. I think there is a view for people outside um, the Christian faith that they're more comfortable with the idea of. I think how do I put this? I think there's a view. There is a predominant view of people outside Christianity that, as a faith, it should be small and quaint and not get in the way of people's lives. I think I think a lot of people who don't have any interaction with faith think it should stay in the corner, right? And I think one of the things that you would have to say Pentecostal Christianity and certainly Hillsong uh, did is uh, they did not stay in the corner. They got, mm. they, you know, they got big and they... Uh, they played music that felt like pop music, you know, like it's, uh, and, and anybody's ever been to either the conferences or even just a, a, you know, one of the decent sized churches services know that as a, just on a pure showmanship level, they're incredible, like yeah. incredible. Um, so I think some people think that it just shouldn't be like that. It should be like old and distant. And, and actually it's, it's also worth pointing out lots of people do find their faith in the old and the, they find their faith, they, they find a sense of spiritual satisfaction and realization in, uh, I guess a liturgical language. There's a phrase I didn't expect to use today, Aaron, uh, that is, that is older and, and it's more deeply rooted in rituals from another era, right? Lots of mm. Catholics, for example, I love the, the rituals they find the safety and, um, it, it's, it's their language and it works for them. Uh, and I get that that's fine. Like, a, you know, there's no problem with that. Everybody has, can express themselves or, or can commute or feels like they can communicate with a high power through a different language for, let, for lack of a better term. Um, but you're right in the sense that I do think there's a lot of people outside the faith that look at it and go, they're uncomfortable when it starts to look and feel like contemporary pop music. Um, I think that's accurate in terms of your interpretation of what's happening outside of the faith. Uh, I don't have a view. <laughs> no, this is going to be a consistent theme, Aaron. I, I don't have a view on whether it's inherently a good thing or a bad thing. I don't. I don't. I think um, uh, I, I, the fact that Pentecostal churches have, you know, have perfected, you know, really big, catchy pop songs. Uh, I don't think it's an inherently good or bad thing. I think it's a, it's a lang, it's finding a language to communicate thing. Um, I think they've been really good at. Um, I think they've been really effective at um, making songs that people want to listen to and want to engage with. Or as I mentioned earlier, they won Grammys. They've, they consistently hit the top of ARIA charts in this country. I have done in the past. Like there's no question that on a measure of do people want to listen, they win. Right. So uh, I don't like, I don't think there's an inherently bad thing with creating, uh, with communicating in the language of the moment. Um, but it's also sort of, it's worth pointing out that that is a big part of their, their success. Um, so, you know, as you say, I, I don't frame it as a negative. I don't necessarily think it is a negative. I do think it's crucial to particularly Hillsong success, uh, but I don't necessarily think it's a negative or positive. I just think it's a thing. Mm. All right. There was one part of the documentary that brought me to tears. Um, it was about your own personal experience um, and that you never found God within the church. Um, and, there was only two options. One is that there are thousands and thousands of people in the Pentecostal church that are fake um, and there is no God. Or two, God is real and those thousands of people are touched by God, but he's ignoring you. That's brutal, Mark. Um, I'm not even sure what my, my question is. I Is there a possibility in your mind at all that there could be an option three maybe? Well, it's interesting as... Since the film's come out, and you will hate this actually, uh, <laughs> as the film's come out, it has been pointed out to me that um, the third option is that the music is so good and effective that people are just being whipped up in the emotion of that, and there is no God still, and I should, and maybe pop music's not my thing, <laughs> and maybe that's, and maybe that's why I didn't feel it. Uh, and quite a few people have drawn other comparisons to other t occasions in history where people have been whipped up into a frenzy. Uh, which I won't necessarily repeat because some of it's not very, uh, I don't think particularly kind or fair. Um, I think, yeah, look, it wasn't great. Uh, I still, it's pretty unresolved for me. You know, I think 
there's an inevitable question I always get asked at the end of every single interview, which is what do I believe? Um, and I, well, and I think, I think where it's left me is, um, well, we put it this way, like if you're a, if you're a kid that comes from not an overly happy home life, and then you encounter a feeling where the creator of the universe has gone, you know, I'm going to speak to absolutely everybody in this room, but that guy in aisle three, not him. It is mm-hmm. just a very hard thing to navigate. Like it, I think to an outsider, and I've noticed this in terms of people's reactions to that scene, uh, outsiders tend, it doesn't tend to land for them as much as it does for people that have an experience of being inside any church. This is what I mean when I say the film's a bit of a Rorschach test. It's like it, depending on your experience, people in, have, and I've never encountered this before, I must say, for anything I've ever made depending on your experience as a viewer, whether you have good experiences of church, bad experiences of church, if you ran away, like everyone brings that baggage to the film and then just sees completely different things. But for people that have experience within the church, that's always the moment. <laughs> that's almost usually the moment they slide into my Instagram DMs and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> like it's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting to become a lightning rod for those feelings for people. Um, I, have felt it for, yeah, it's probably, it took me a while, actually years to be able to articulate why it was so difficult. And, um, yeah, I don't have an answer to it either, to be honest with you, Aaron. I'm sort of just waiting to see what people make of it, I guess, which is an unusual, like it's, it's the whole thing, to be honest with you, the whole thing's really strange. Like we, we ripped up the film and reshaped it two or three times because we weren't quite sure how much of me it needed. Uh, and, but every time we re- we ripped it up, like that moment, I was always like, I feel like that is the clearest articulation of where I'm at. Um, and I was like, if, if you, if you are confused about how I feel about this thing, that moment explains it. Um, yeah. So I guess it's sort of, I suspect it'll become one of these like defining things, I guess, for me over time. I don't know. Yeah. Time will and the laziest the laziest end to every answer that you will ever find in um in any kind of news report. If the news reporter doesn't know how to end a the story, they'll always go, Time will tell, Mark Pennell, seven news. I'm doing that to you. I'm like time will telling you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, but as the as the Pentecostal movement um crumbled over the allegations at Hillsong, or do you think that the hype will live on through churches like Planet Shakers in, in Kingdom City? I mean, look, Planet Shakers and Kingdom City, they're, they are in this, and Planet Shakers has been around for a while, but they they show certainly no signs of slowing down, that's for sure. Um, I'm not, look, you know, Hillsong does still have lots of people going to it. Uh, it's clear that they're in a crisis mode a little bit. Um, what happens next with Hillsong is really up to them. You know, I'm really intrigued to see what they do next. They're under, obviously under new leadership. Like I'm intrigued to see what everyone does next, actually. I'm intrigued to see what their earlier global pastors, Brian and Bobby Houston, do next, because there'll be a verdict in their trial in the coming weeks. Um, I'm interested to see what Hillsong does. I mean, Hillsong love to put out statements whenever, obviously there's been a few major Hillsong docos that have all come from the kind of the US and they always tell the story from the American perspective. And I'm like, that's great, but this is an Australian story. Like we birthed this thing. This is on us for better, for worse, which it should be told from an Australian perspective. Uh, and I, I think every time one of those documentaries come out, they always put out a statement being like, that represents the church as it was years ago. We're different now. And it's always kind of the same sort of boilerplate thing. And uh, I think they need to prove it. Mm. You know, like I think they need to, because if you've got people leaving, um, you actually need to go wider with your messaging than just sort of put it out in statements. I actually think they need to, they need to front up and they need to answer questions about how they're different. Yeah. Um, and how, like, uh, you know, I'm, no one's, well, I'm certainly not sitting there going, shut it down. I'm like, this is a, clearly a thing that people have found enormous um, uh, sense of belonging and a lot of people getting their cups filled up every week. Right. So let's not, so I, I'm, no one's sitting here in this chair going, burn it all down. But I do think if they're going to put out statements saying we've changed, it's different. I think they need to front up and answer questions about yeah. why they're different. That doesn't, I'm not saying that has to be with me. I mean, there's plenty of other places they can talk to, but they do. They, at some point they will need to talk. 
um, to people beyond the four walls. Uh, I don't know when that moment will come, but when they do, I'll be I'll be re- watching for sure. All right. Well, we're just about ready to wrap up, but um, a couple of other questions uh, while you're here. I mean, you're a busy guy, also hosting Mastermind. Um, very versatile with your career. How are you enjoying being a quiz show host? I we shoot for two months at the beginning of the year, and then it sort of plays out throughout the year. This is like very intense period of of me sitting in the chair. So we shoot five <laughs> episodes a day. Um, we so so we shoot a week in a day, and uh, it, you we sort of enter. I say like you enter the black box because you you go into the studio and then you are like when this before the sun comes up and then you leave at the end of the day and the sun's gone again. You're like, where did it go? Um, I love it. <clears throat> I love it because we have a really lovely team that make it. And I love it because of the contenders, like the, the format, it's interesting. The way I do the show is so different to the way it's done everywhere else in the world. I've been working a lot with people in the UK over the last couple of years. And when I was approached to take over the show, they all like, do you understand that it's hosted by like the angri- angriest man in Britain? You're not that. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you're right. I'm not. Uh, um, I'm a weird, ambiguously ethnic, <laughs> chubby, happy person <laughs> who does like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not that. Uh, and my thing was, um, I sort of, I, I need to have a reason when I agree to something like, and some things it's more obvious than others, obviously, you know, stuff the British doll or, or, or the King of the Kingdom. It's very obvious why. I guess I care about those things. Whereas mastermind kind of came to me and I sort of had to take a breath and go, what is the thing I can do with this? That is unique. And, or what, why would I do it? And actually what I landed on is, um, I view mastermind as a celebration of nerds. I am a dyed in the wool nerd, right? So (laughs) I was like, what I, the way I approach it is this, you know, we're on it before the news every night, throughout the year repeats constantly, you know, like it's just going to be on for years and years and years. Right. So my view is people come on the show when they sit in the chair, I want the audience to get to understand why does this person love this topic? What does it say about, what does it say about them? And then when the lights go down and the questions start, it's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of situation. It's like I, me, like when the lights are on the, when the, when you just sit in the chair, like, let's get to know you. Why do you, why do you care about, narrow gauge Welsh railways or French lace manufacturing, or, you know, (laughs) that one season of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, like let's get to know (laughs) you and who you are, and then let's put it to the test. And I think that's the thing. I view it as a celebration of nerds. uh, And that's how I've always approached it. So I'm not like, I don't do the mean, like I do, I do a little bit of smiling assassin, which I've, what I sit there with like a smile on my face going, "Mm mm-hmm. Why? Like I do that, but it's not, I just don't do mean. Uh, it's not my way of doing the show. Um, even though the show, I mean, the show, the the inspiration for the show initially was the was the creator basically taking the experience of being interrogated by the Nazis in World War II and turned it into a quiz show. Like that's the origin of Mastermind. So I'm oh, like, geez. yeah, that's, that's, that's if you look <laughs> it up, that, like, that's the origin of it. It's, he basically, um, I don't know if it's he that was interrogated by the Nazis or somebody else he did, but he basically took the experience of being interrogated by the Nazis and turned it into a quiz show which is just very British. <laughs> um, so I was like, look, that that element of it, there are parts of it that abs- there's a sort of um, elegance, I guess, to the mastermind format. Um, and you keep certain things. But what I think is that if you're going to be on before the news every night, you do have to have some warmth and you have to understand your characters. You have to, everybody that sits in that chair, the audience need to decide very quickly, do I want this person to win or I don't want this person to lose? <laughs> they have to get to know them as a person. So that was my why. I think it is a, a celebration of nerds. We shoot, like I said, two months at the beginning of the year, and then it kind of plays out. And I, uh, and I've actually, you know what? Today I think might actually be the, um, uh, the finale. Um, I've been so busy kind of promoting the kingdom that I actually should double check that. But yeah, look, I I love it for that reason. Um, and then it sort of plays out for the rest of the year, and you kind of like have to remind yourself to to keep talking about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So, so will the format remain the same or are there plans for oh, another yeah. ce- celebrity edition though coming out? There are no plans for a celebrity edition. Um, I personally would love to do a family edition. Like oh, that's, yeah. uh, that's what I, we, we actually had a, an episode this season where a whole family competed against each other and it was dynamite. It yeah. was great. I, I'd re- personally, I'd really want to do a family edition or a kid's edition. Um, kid stuff kind of, it, kid stuff works really well on the ABC, um, SBS 
it's hard it's harder to gauge whether it works so i think that's probably where the hesitancy comes from but um at a minimum i would i we i've been pushing me and the bbc um studios team have been like a family edition of the show would actually kill um but i guess the other thing that you could say is like even within the existing format you can still do that like you can still have episodes dedicated to families we do themed weeks and stuff like that so um <clears throat> what i do think is important is like making sure that the the mix of contenders represents australia so it's a mix obviously of of gender and and uh, representing kind of the the diversity of australia i think that's really important and really hard and i think they've worked really hard to get to that stage where the show looks like the nation it's talking to i think people get caught up in conversations around diversity and it can kind of get a bit up in its own head my thing is like i just want a show to look like the country that we're talking to it's, it should never be more it should never be more or less complicated than that i reckon yeah well the movie show hungry beast the feed india now podcasting writing mastermind documentaries do you deliberately look for variations in your work or has it just been you know take the opportunities that they come along because that is a super varied role <laughs> roles it's a bit of both like in in terms of things I drive, like stuff the British stole, the show I did for the ABC last year was was quite big and, and I was relieved because it's, it's a show I created. Um, it began as a podcast and then became a television show. And um, when it's stuff I when it's stuff I drive or I create, I am looking for I'm looking for variation. I'm looking for things. I'm looking, you know what? I, I pick jobs so I can learn is the short answer to you. Like I every job I end up doing, I end up doing because I'm, I want to learn something new. Like with, you know, with kingdom, kingdom's almost like a bit of an, an old outlier in that sense, because I, it was, it's more about, because <laughs> it had different elements to what I normally do. But, but even within that, like it's, it's a very different film to say framed or stuff, the British style or the, the next two series that I've got coming out in the next year, they're, they're all quite different. And I think, you want to feel like every job you do, you're acquiring new skills and a new way of working that you can help infuse with the next job. So, so we've got this um, amazingly fun three-part art heist documentary um, coming out later in the year that we've done a whole bunch of like recreations with actors for. Um, and it's, you know, it's like an evolution of what we did with Framed, uh, kind of, it's sort of like Framed on Crack. It's like, it's a much bigger... <laughs> Like, and it takes us all around the world. We end up going to New York and, and and London and the Philippines. It's wild. And I think we could only do that because of the lessons that was learned from making frame. So I think with every job you want to do, you want to feel like you're learning new things and you're kind of pushing the boundaries a bit more. So with all that variation, what what's still on the bucket list? Mm. Uh when I did the feed, which is the current affair show I did for the ABC, I my main job was interviewing people. I would sit down and do profile interviews with people. And I've interviewed the biggest stars on the planet. We did Tom Cruise. We did Jennifer Lawrence, Will Smith. Like, you know, and it's been interesting. I Because the feed has ended last year, I went back actually over my archives, basically just the, the raw hard drives of interviews with people. And just as an experiment, <laughs> because multiple TV networks told me I, I needed a TikTok account. So I was like, okay, fine. As an experiment, I started like going through and pulling out two, three minute clips from some of those interviews and literally millions of views later, <laughs> it's like, I, I didn't expect them to be as such a big hit as they are to the point that I actually was at Coles the other day and somebody came up to me and said, are you the guy from TikTok? And I was like, I think I've made it. <laughs> I think I've made it. <laughs> um, but actually what it did remind me is um, I would... I loved sitting down and interviewing people and, and creating an environment where people feel comfortable sharing who they are. And it occurred to me that at some point I would like to do a proper interview show. Um, it doesn't have to be now. I've got a pretty full slate, but it's like, I think it was when those interviews started doing millions of views online so that, that I realized like they, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm bad at it. <laughs> I think, I think it works. <laughs> So I, I, it is something I'm kind of keeping in the back of my mind that I, I would like to do a proper interview show. And I think there is a bit of a glut of them at the moment. Um, and so I don't like, I'm, I'm comfortable waiting until the right time is right. Uh, but a really great interview show is enrapturing. 
a person yeah. telling you an inc incredible story, the intimacy you create, it is absolutely enrapturing and if, if done well, um, and it doesn't always need bells and whistles. I mean, some of the shows I make are not short on bells and whistles, right? Stuff the British Doll is a huge production with multiple countries and two networks and, um, and I love it and it's an amazing adventure, but, um, there is part of me that's just like, you can still create gripping moments with two people in a room. Uh, and so I, I think it's, it's not a thing I want, and it's not a thing I'm going to do like tomorrow. Um, but I think in time I would like to, to do that and make a return to that kind of show. Yeah. It's interesting that those shows are very simple concepts, but it, they could crash and burn quite easily. I mean, if you have a great interviewer like Parkinson or, or in Australia, Andrew Denton, I mean, it, it can just really make the show, um, depending on who's, uh, hosting. Um, I just wanted to ask though, you did mention the art heist project coming up, but is there anything else that you can mention that's coming up? Uh, so that one will be out at, so I've got a mixture of te television shows and, and some podcast stuff that I've done overseas. Uh, so I've got a, a six part podcast that I've been working on for a couple of years with Audible and Sony over in New York, uh, which is a, which is a sort of, it's very much a bit like stuff, the British stole, but specifically in America. Um, mm -hmm. then after that, uh, in television, um, I've got this three hour, this three part art heist series that so that'll come the, the three-part art high series will come out in October late October and that'll be on SBS um and that's that one we've been working on for a while and it'll be uh it'll be big like it's it's got it's it feels big I mean we go all around the world and we've got recreations with actors it's a it's it's a it's a really and it's fun and it's and then it has these great twists and it's dark and it's it's I'm really excited um pretty much from uh I'm taking the kids on a holiday <laughs> in the next seven weeks. When I, pretty much when I get back, as soon as I get back, we are filming season two of Stuff the British Style. So I'll be, and it's a bigger season, this one. So it'll be lots more countries. Um, we're kind of changing up to some of the style of it. Um, that will be, that will be on air. It won't be on air this year. It'll be on air next year. Um, so that's, that's coming out. So we start filming pretty soon for that. Um, and then the, I guess it remains to be seen whether SBS want to do more mastermind. They they usually make a call on that sort of in the middle of the year. So we'll find out. Um, yep. But yeah, so I, you know, we'll wait and see, I guess on that one. Um, and this doco team that works at SBS, we're kind of on a rolling basis. So I would imagine that we would start working on um, two, two new series for 2024. So you, I think we want to set an expectation that we do sort of two of them a year. The kingdom is a, is a feature film partially because um, it had the shortest lead time. Um, whereas the other ones, I think you sh should expect series, um, sort of multiple, multiple part series. Um, and yeah, I'm working with different, I'm with my audio stuff. I work with Aud Audible in the U S and I'm doing some stuff with the BBC. So I'm sort of juggling a bit and I've always got my ABC radio show, download the show. So I sort of, I piece it together a little bit. Mm. Um, I, it's kind of, I like being able to move from thing to thing. I, my challenge sometimes is that I have everything going all at once. Like the title of the movie, everything, everywhere, all at once is probably not also a good career plan. Um, so I, I probably just need to try and stagger some bits and pieces out a little <laughs> bit more just for like my own health, you know, mm, <laughs> like yeah. I spent a quarter of last year on the road filming either, um, stuff, the British style, the art heist thing, or, and obviously a little bit of kingdom shot in America. So, uh, I've got to balance it out with the fact that, you know, I've got kids and, you know, like I like being able to do pickups and drop-offs and, you, you know, like the boring but necessary yeah. part of being an adult that I love is you kind of got to juggle it a little bit um, with, you know, traipsing around palaces and and all the other stuff, you know. Just palaces. Just palaces those, yeah, and deserts yeah. and all of other fun stuff. You sort of need to go, yeah, but I still, we still need to like have lunches ready in the morning to go. Like there's a sort of balancing <laughs> act that, like, I don't know what people's perception of my life is or if anybody's ever thought of it at all, but I'm also just like, there's like, the, there is a certainly a glamorous, fun, adventurous part to it. And then there's like, you know, the reason our interview was at nine and not eight thirties because I had to drop the kids to school, you know, like <laughs> there's, there's like a balancing act that is possibly invisible to people. Oh, nice though. Palaces on Monday, ham sandwiches for the kids on Tuesdays, you know, yeah. who knows on Wednesdays. Um, yeah. 
There's been uh, lots of current affairs shows investigating Hillsong as of mm. late due to allegations and um, findings being made. So it was refreshing to step back and look at the whole Pentecostal movement in a deeply personal way. So thank you so much for that. And um, thank you for joining me at TV Central. It was lovely to talk to you. Hopefully, um, hopefully it was interesting. So I ramble a lot. I'm not very, I'm not very, um, I'm not very concise, Aaron. I sort of just ramble. I, th- I think, I think we like the go from the heart. So, and that was perfect. All right. All good. Happy to chat. <laughs> all right. That was uh, Mark Fennell. The Kingdom is now available on SBS On Demand and will screen on SBS at 7.30 p.m. Sunday, the 11th of June. That's it for this podcast. For all the latest news, streaming options, ratings, TV guides and podcasts, head to tvcentral.com.au. Until next time, I'm Aaron Ryan. Thanks to Mark Fennell. Bye for now.